So this will be um, continuation because the bill messed up or the <coughs> camera messed up. Hopefully this continues to record. So should be one, three, two short circuit bracing. Um, just hang with me. I'm going to go a little bit quick because I just went through all this and I didn't realize it wasn't recording or a stock recording for some reason. So, um, one, three, two, first sentence is highlighted. All incoming lines to, all incoming lines to either incoming line lugs or main disconnects must be braced to withstand the mechanical force created by a high fault current. So, these big wires have to be braced because if a short circuit happens, like this stuff jolts and you don't want this stuff moving, getting loose, causing more issues. Um, anything like that. Like you don't want this stuff uh, coming in contact, creating some type of arc fault. So you have to have some type of bracing on these main wires to make sure they're not going to move around a bunch. Um, moving on to section two, making wire connections. So section two up here on the board, uh, making wire connections. First sentence on section on page 12 is an online test question. NEC section 110.14 governs electrical connections, including terminations and splices. Um, so you just need to know that NEC section. You will be able to use your NEC book on this test. Um, so it should be an easy one to look up. Top right of page 12, last sentence of that split paragraph is highlighted. The range is normally stamped on the tongue of each excuse me, tongue of each terminal. So if I flip ahead a little bit. I can see that this terminal has 16 to 14 gauge um, stamped on it. So with these bigger ones, I just don't have a um, good picture of where they're stamped. Um, moving down, uh, where you see the reducing connect uh, connector, that sentence is highlighted. A crimp type reducing connector is used to connect two different sides of wires. So you can have a reducing connector different types of wires. I, I don't usually use these because I don't like connecting two different uh, size of wires, not type sizes of wires. Like usually everything's going to be the same. I'm, I'm not a big fan of connecting different sizes of wires. Um, but stuff's out there. Page 14, installing connectors. 211, installing compression connectors. You're going to have... You're going to have um, this graph that's going to be important. Your mechanical advantage or your me best mechanical um, spot versus your electrical spot are at different places. So you're going to want to find a middle, uh, a middle point, which is point C on the graph. Uh, the second paragraph, second sentence to the end of the paragraph is highlighted. I've got a couple of questions that come out of this highlight. Maximum mechanical strength A occurs at a lower crimping force than the, than the maximum electrical performance B. The point of intersection C represents the ideal crimping force. Using a crimping die that is too large results in poor electrical performance, and using a die that's too small produces a weak mechanical connection. All right, so you want somewhere between the best mechanical, best electrical, it's gonna be point C. It's gonna take a while, while um, to get that with different, like these different types of big um, connectors like this can only put you can only push these uh, handles so far together, so it's gonna, it should create a better, um, better crimp than if you can just keep going. Um, on the right hand side of the page, the second paragraph on the right hand side of the page, first sentence um, is highlighted. Simple pliers are basically a constant mechanical advantage tool. The mechanical advantage is the same whether the crimp is being started or finished. So that's the, um, that's like your blue handle clients. You're just gonna have a constant mechanical advantage. Um, that you can you can make go too far or be uh, not enough. So just know that that's there. Moving on to page 17. You know, highlights to page 17 going into specialized cable uh, connectors 213. Um, the, on the right hand side of the page, I highlighted the sentence that's before the little part of the sentence that's before the steps. Type MC cable is explained here. So different steps for uh, connecting MC cable. Step one is highlighted. Select the correct connector size. This is normally done by comparing the physical dimensions of the cable to a cross-reference table given in the manufacturer's product literature and or installation instructions. You want to make sure step one is highlighted. 
Uh, moving on to page 18, 220 aluminum connections. 220, so this is this is going to be for AL or your aluminum connections. 220, page 18, second paragraph, everything except the last sentence is highlighted. Because of the thermal expansion of, and cold flow of aluminum, standard copper connections cannot be safely used on aluminum wire. Most manufacturers design their aluminum connectors with a greater contact area to counteract this problem. Next paragraph, you have two separate highlights in this next paragraph. The whole thing is highlighted. The last sentence is an online test question. The electrolytic action between aluminum and copper can be controlled by plating the aluminum with a neutral metal, usually tin. This plating prevents electrolysis from taking place and the joint remains tight. Last sentence, this last sentence, online test question. Connectors should also be tin plated and pre-filled with an oxide inhibiting compound. We have some of this compound out in the lab somewhere. It looks like a silver paste. Um, you don't want oxides to build up in your connection. Oxide is, an, is a current inhibitor or it's, a, it's an insulator. You don't want insulation, insulation inside your connection. So this, this paste is gonna um, make it to where that oxides don't build up inside your connections. Top left of page 19, these are general rules um, for making connectors uh, or general rules for connectors. First bullet point in the top left of page 19 is highlighted. Connectors marked with only the wire size should be used with only copper conductors. It has to be marked with that AL in order to um, be used with aluminum. Or you can see in the third bullet point it can be marked ALCU, which means you can use either ones, which is normally what I've seen um, in my experience is most connectors can do um, either one. 230 control and signal cables. So this would be like your instrumentation type uh, cables. Page 19, right hand side of the page, last paragraph before 231, everything's highlighted except for the last sentence. To be effective, the shielding drain wires must be grounded. The installation loop diagrams or instructions for the system equipment will indicate how and where the shields are to be connected and grounded. Typically only one end is grounded and the drain wire at the other end is isolated by holding back and taping it over. Um, you can see your drain wires and shields up here in this picture or at the bottom right of page 19. So only one side of those drain wires are grounded. And this is to prevent uh, if you ground both sides. You can actually have a ground loop, which is a pain in the butt to try to find. Make sure you're only grounding one end of a um, shield or drain wire. Page 20. First, the full sentence on page 20 is highlighted. The insulation color is color coded according to the connector's wire range to reduce the problem of wire to connector mismatch. So you can see um, this connector that's up here on the board or on your page 20 is yellow. So that's gonna be a certain size. You can see you're gonna have a question come out of um, that table five on page, the bottom right of page 21, the uh, wire size. So it's 22 to 16 gauge is red, 16 to 14 is blue, and 12 to 10 is a yellow. So this yellow connector right here can accept 12 gauge wire or 10 gauge wire. Uh, so just know that they're color coded, but they're also usually uh, stamped on the end as well. So this one on the board is, is stamped 16 to 14. So that would have a color code of blue on it more than likely. Next paragraph, right in the middle of that paragraph, I've got three sentences highlighted. Tongue styles vary depending on termination requirements. Figure 30, um, which is what's on the board, shows standard tongue styles. The styles most frequently used are the ring tongue and the flange or locking fork. That just depends on, on what you're using. I've used the ring tongue, not a huge fan because you have to take the screw all the way out to get them in and out. Um, I usually like the fork style the best. Uh, locking fork, I haven't really used a ton, but it's just gonna be whatever whatever environment, whatever is available to you in order to use that stuff. You have a bunch of different options for that. So then they go through the crimping procedure for crimping these things. Um, step seven on page 22, first sentence is highlighted. Insert the strip wire to the bill barrel of the terminal until the insulation butts firmly against the forward stop. That is a online test question. So you want to make sure that the insulation up here on the board is all the way butted up against there. You don't want you don't want any kind of movement in there. It's gonna it's gonna get loose and create a bad termination. Top right of page 22, 233, terminal inspection. So if you're, you always want to do, I always say do a tug test on these whenever you're, after you terminate them. But 
Top right of page 22, second sentence is highlighted. The crimp barrel is designed to provide the best mechanical strength when the indent is properly placed on the top seam of the barrel. So all these have a, have a split seam on them. So this is where you want to put your indent. Not on the back. I used to think the back was where you put this indent. Nope, you want your indent on the top. You want this to like fold over and clamp down onto your wires, creating a good uh, termination. That's it for section two. I'm going to go directly into section three. Section three, taping. Taping is going to be very important. Uh, highlights 310. I've got four different highlights just on page 26. Second paragraph, it's the sentence that splits the columns and the one before it. Electrical tapes made of vital plastic are widely used as the primary insulation on joints made of thermoplastic insulation wire. Thermoplastic insulation insulated wires. They are used for splices up to 600 volt and for fiction wire splices up to 1,000 volts. Biggest thing with this, don't buy cheap tape. Buy the, buy the nicer stuff, that Super 88 or whatever it is. Um, then you're not wanting to use brittle tape for this stuff. Next paragraph, the first couple sentences of that paragraph are highlighted. Line on this rubber splicing tape provides for a tight, void free, moisture resistant insulation without the loss of electrical characteristics. It's typically used for primary insulation with all solid, di solid dielectric cables through 70,000 volts. This tape can be used for a large uh, voltage. Uh, next paragraph, first sentence is one highlight. High temperature silicone rubber tapes are used as a protective overwrap for terminating high voltage cables. Kind of what we just said. Next sentence is a separate highlight. Glass cloth electrical tape to provide a heat stable insulation for hot spot applications such as furnace and oven controls, motor leads, and switches. And where you're going to use something that's pretty hot, it can keep um, some of that heat off of those terminations, um, which heat is never good for a termination because it can, um, even with these split bolt uh, fasteners, what happens when you when you heat something up and let it cool off, heat up, cool off, this, this termination, this, all this metal is going to become it's going to expand and contract and, and potentially loosen this um, this bolt. So you always you want to have that glass heat, which can, can expel some of the heat from that termination, depending on where it is. Heat shrink insulators, 320. Um, third sentence is highlighted on page 27. When heat is applied, the insulation becomes semi-rigid and provides positive strain relief at the flex point of the conductor. So you've got your um, heat shrink, you can see up here on the board, you can put that on with a heat gun. Um, I've seen people use a lighter, I've seen, I, I've used a hot uh, a hair dryer, um, but that's going to make it to where that, that connection is not going to bend as much and it's going to provide positive strain relief. And they go into the different things that, that these um, splices can be made of. On page 27, you can see that the PVC starts it off in the bullet point, but if you flip the page to page 28, uh, the Teflon bullet point first sentence is highlighted. Teflon, this type is considered by many users to be the best overall heat treat tubing, physically, electrically, and chemically. That's, that's going to be probably your more, most prevalent. It's going to be your um, Teflon tape. The last bullet point in that section, the, not, the Kynar, uh, first sentence is highlighted. This is a thin wall, semi-rigid tubing with outstanding resistance to abrasion. So if your connection is going to have um, the knock around on different stuff, this might be what you want for your um, your heat shrink, so they can it can withstand some of that um, uh, abrasion. Three three zero motor connection kits. Um, first paragraph, right in the middle, the sentence that's got figure forty highlighted in it. Most motor connection kits are available for use with stub or butt splice connections. Figure forty, where they're uh, where there's insufficient room to make an inline connection. So you can use these uh, for inline connections. Uh, last sentence on the page is also highlighted. Typically the kit's selected based on the size of the motor feeder cable. So you can see those connections being made on page 30. Um, like I said, you're, you're picking it based on the size of your wire. Um, sometimes your wire, like you can see in this picture, your wires are different sizes. Um, so you're making sure to put those on in the correct order um, and stuff like that. Uh, that's all I have for this section. So you got your section reviews, your module review, your uh, supplemental exercise, and then your online quiz.